the source of the trouble. If you follow the ideas behind the history of evolution, then this should be clear. There had to be a point where one Neanderthal decided that since he was the biggest and the strongest, he would make every other member of the group do what he wanted them to do, regardless of their opinion on the matter. I'm pretty sure a few clubs and rocks went into the discussion. Og, ne the Neanderthal, typifies every leader of assorted human groups up to the Middle Ages. Power was not given by any vote of acclamation or proof of merit that benefited the society as a whole. It was acquired by force of arms. The royal families we have today exist because their ancestors were meaner, more vicious thugs than the other guys. That is a simple fact of history. The other fact is that once the first set of heads rolled, the rest was easy. Thus began the right of ascension and heritage that today is called royalty or blue bloods. Now with control over the people gained, it became simplicity itself for the royals to begin demanding certain privileges that required the labor of others to supply. After a couple of generations, the habit became so ingrained that such privilege went far beyond custom into a sort of divine right. And the privileges did not stop at being the first to be served from the result of the successful hunt. No, they eventually resolved into displays of perversion that would cause a pornographer to blush. Examples can be found in histories all over the world. This type of character flaw has been and continues to be present in every color of humanity, regardless of the culture. Adding to the issue is that, along with the chiefs, there are plenty of followers. Some go along as a sort of fawning henchman, clutching at the skirts of the leader like a remora to a shark, feeding off of the leftovers regardless of what those leftovers consist of. Outside of that circle are those who serve the elite, some in hopes of gaining more access to the halls of power. Some are there simply because that is where their abilities placed them. They are the realist, who know how far they can go and are willing to do whatever it takes to remain in their position. In many ways, these are the villains who do the most harm to the culture at large. The circles of power that radiate from the center are manifold and varied, but they all have this one trait in common. They crave that power and will do what it takes to keep their small piece of it. Whether they be the sycophants with no real ability of their own other than the talent of flattery, the seductress who use their sensuality to maintain position and access to the throne, the trustworthy functionaries willing to place policy over compassion, or the sort of bottom feeder that populates every governmental center. Competent enough, but also unsavory enough that even the true villains somehow feel a little less clean after having to deal with them. All of these can be found in every capital of the world, every capital of every state, every county, every city, and every place of business. As long as we have people, we will have these. Along with these facts is the one that there will always be those who watch from the outside with the degree of native cunning and intellect that removes them from the herd. These are the revolutionaries, the ones with the ability to excite a crowd, even if what they are spouting hasn't a grain of truth or logic to it. They make it sound real, and for most that is enough. Today, we see them as the pundits, the talk show hosts, and the news anchors. Except the term news should be italicized. These claim to be the voice of the people, when in reality, they are working at attempting to become the puppet masters outside the circle of authority, exercising authority without the liability of being the authority. Those revolutionaries who find manipulation to be too thin for their ego, eventually step across into the circle of authority, these are the ones who attach themselves to the wolves as an alkalite, and with the wolves, circle the herd and occasionally separate the weak, the ill, or the impressionable. Sometimes they're fed upon and discarded. Sometimes they are turned into wolves themselves. A few rare times, they overtake their mentor, and then the real trouble begins. There was a revolution in Imperial Russia that was led by one such, and nearly every upheaval since has come about the same way. The wolves see a weakness, and then they exploit it. Corrupt the young, get them away from religion, encourage their interest in sex, make them superficial by focusing their attention on sports, sensual entertainments, and other trivialities. 
always preach true democracy, but seize power as fast and as ruthlessly as possible. Encourage government extravagance, destroy its credit. Produce fear with rising prices, inflation, and general discontent. Encourage disorders and foster a lenient attitude towards disorders. By specious argument, cause the breakdown of the old moral virtues. Honesty, sobriety, self-restraint. Cause registration of firearms to leave the population defenseless. The above is a possible quote by one of these wolves, known as Vladimir Lenin. Now, it is not my place here to debate its authenticity because regardless of that, it happens to be a formula that has been adapted and appears to be working in today's society. As one of those who is now the older generation, I have witnessed the gradual change in how youth view their elders and how they view each other. When I was a teenager, a successful date was getting a kiss goodbye. Now, if it's not a home run, it's not a date. History was a passion of mine then as it is now, and I remember listening to debates, news reports, and other important events entrenched at the moment because this was important stuff. Now the discussion has about as much depth as the pixels on the TV screen and far too many people cannot recite the recent history, much less those events that shape the world they live in. And those few who do mainly get their facts wrong, especially if those facts do not fit the addenda du jour. How many times have we listened to campaign promises that have never come to pass? How many times have we been worse off after a term of administration than better? This is one of those uncomfortable truths. Making promises these days is almost as easy as it was for Og to club his constituents into submission. Perhaps more so because even the most ardent supporters of the candidates do not appear to really expect their leader to tell the truth. I found this out firsthand when I happened to win elective office by promising certain things and then dismaying my own party by keeping those promises. I was run out of office, being called too honest to be trusted. One former president has actually been threatened with impeachment for the crimes of keeping his campaign promises. I wish that was hyperbole. We have several very powerful politicians in this country who have amassed immense wealth simply by selling their power. Some have only worked in the private sector for a year and a calculation of their salary, including common costs, debits, and credits, totals to a tiny fraction of the whole. This is the dark underbility of the preaching of true democracy while seizing power. We have all witnessed the evolution of the playboy politician over the years, and it is no secret of the amount of waste that continues, not just unabated, but on a seemingly exponential increase among those who control the purse strings. When you have that extravagance, that obvious corruption, and all of it in the face of real people suffering through real financial issues, it is no secret that the creditor the government may have had with the people is no more. Now it would be impossible for the government to attempt to administrate this country on trust alone, and that is why we are seeing more and more policies becoming mandated statutes, regardless of the rules prohibiting such behavior. When my grandfather was a boy, money was minted in actual precious metal. Gold coins came in denominations of 50, 20, and 10 dollars. Silver coins came in one dollar, 50 cents, 25 cents, and 10 cents increments. Back then, a $20 coin would buy you a very good suit, and a silver dime could buy you supper. They still can today. Think about that. Back then, gasoline was the cheapest part of running a car, and goods cost next to nothing to get to market. Even at those giveaway prices, the people who owned the fuel companies made incredible fortunes and were able to pay their workers a wage capable of supporting a family. Now, the assorted measures intended to cause inflation are nearly all in place, and most families cannot afford to go to the store, much less buy the goods they can find there. Is it any wonder riots are becoming more and more common, and the incident of violent crime has driven the police away from certain neighborhoods? It also has become very easy to blame people for the problems of others and to assign a responsibility that cannot exist under any system of logic, and yet the blame is assigned. In the American black culture, it is now considered gospel by some that a white baby is born inherently evil, and somehow by extension, that baby is the reason some blacks have trouble succeeding in society at large. This is foolish on its face and throughout its system, but many in power now want to legitimize that fantasy into an actual government-sponsored program called critical race theory. 
The factor of self-responsibility has become so demonized that in some circles, it is thought of as being either racist or hateful to even bring it up. This in no way eliminates the other races from blame. Each and all have their distinct form of bias that is used to remove them from the trouble they bring upon themselves. Currently, the American black is being used as a wedge by assorted political entities to keep the nation divided. Even worse is the apparent ease that this seems to be accomplished. Try bringing up the fact that the constitutional right for someone to express an unfunny and offensive racial statement, and you will be accused of supporting that frame of thought. It even seems that no one remembers the statement by Evelyn Beatrice Hall in her book, The Friends of Voltaire. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Now, as an avid fan of storytelling, I begin my journey to this point listening to a very large archtop AM radio that sat next to my bed. These were the days of classic radio dramas, sketch comedy and serials such as Superman, The Green Hornet, Sam Spade, Johnny Dollar, and many, many others. The focus, because it was all in audio, was both in the writing and the characterizations. Special effects were practically non-existent outside of weather sounds and gunshots. I also had available to me a complete set of the classic Journeys Through Bookland set, hardbound and running from the index all the way through volume 21, Nursery Rhymes to Shakespeare. In both literature and broadcast media, there was a code adopted to make sure the language used was of the highest caliber. A writer who wished to use cursing and profane speech wasn't considered much of a writer, as it takes considerably less talent to make a scene engrossing using those methods. Today, it takes a considerable amount of time to find a quality book or program, much less one that doesn't make you ashamed to be seen reading or watching what is shown. The corruption of our entertainment has had its impact on both the family unit and how today's youth comport themselves versus yesterday's. When I was a child, you gave your elders the respect they had coming to them. Of course, in my youth, my elders were almost entirely survivors of World War II. Respect had been earned in both time and in blood. Today, the elders are mostly survivors of the hippie years, and it is pretty difficult to give someone who struck flowers in their hair the same respect as someone who vanquished Hitler. But the issue goes deeper than that. The overall lack of respect has translated itself into a general lack of respect for humanity as a whole, and that is a very serious thing indeed. A few people have been and continue the effort of attempting to re-inject some sort of moral credence into this country. There is a reason why the foundations that built this country worked and why it is currently heading swiftly toward a crevice of dissolution. The fight is certainly not an easy one, mostly by and large because so many of the socialist persuasion have found out that they can generate very comfortable livings as incredible hypocrites by convincing less informed folk that the morals of their past are for the uneducated hicks who still cling bitterly to their guns and religion. All the while, these leaders maintain households strictly run under the same general rules they condemn outside their own walls. There is almost no way a child born of a single mother who may not even know which of her current boyfriends is the father can succeed in life, though there are exceptions to the rule. Children raised in single-parent households do not do as well as the demographic as those in a committed single-family unit. Progressive social scientists can argue this point until they pass out from lack of oxygen. All the arguments in the world cannot win against hard statistical facts. Their feelings have no weight in the debate. As stated, the exceptions to the rule do exist, but pointing them out is essentially as worthless as pointing to an odd-colored jungle frog and claiming it is an entirely new species, while all the while it is simply an example of albinism. The last point here is the ongoing and unusual heavily-handed attempt to discredit the U.S. Constitution as either outmoded or the even more poisonous term of it being a living document. The men who wrote that document did not just make up the assorted clauses out of empty air. They had been living under the iron fist of a mad tyrant and his many willing accomplices for nearly a century. In some cases, their people had been tortured and even killed for simply standing on a promise that made the tyrant had made earlier and now found inconvenient. Some of these abuses came through a quasi-governmental institution called the Church of England a church created by the English King Henry Tudor or Henry VIII. A church, by the way, that had no issue with the enslaving of the Irish by an earlier British monarch. 
The Constitution was written in such a way that the abuses of power the colonists had experienced would either be impossible to create or at the very least difficult in the extreme. Obviously, humanity being humanity, many tried to exert that kind of authority, but because of the Constitution, they were never able to gain much ground beyond a local level. It was this sort of stability that led to the history-making prosperity this country enjoyed. People who have the right to prosper off of their own labor will always outproduce the slaves of a socialist state. This combination of freedom and prosperity also became the focal point of hatred of the Eastern communists. The idea of a people not being in fear or under the absolute control of the state was a reality they could not abide. And based on their reactions to those who managed to beat back attempts to add additional controls to personal freedoms, neither can the progressives of today. The interesting thing is, in many of his writings, Thomas Jefferson thought the amending of the Constitution to be a simple matter. I wonder if he would have helped craft Article 5 the way he had if he had been able to look forward a couple hundred years or more. Because of many factors over the past few decades, the American public has nowhere near the average level of intelligence of their forefathers or the public awareness of times past. This decrease in the public IQ has led to quite a few enemies of the free state being elected to public office. Some of these have made appointments over the years of like-minded officials with the assumption that these appointments will grant them the power to weaken or dismantle the U.S. Constitution. A few of them have felt secure enough in their power to actually voice their disapproval of that document as it currently exists. I would not look to the U.S. Constitution if I were drafting a constitution in the year 2012, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justice of the United States. Bad grammar aside, her statement is a clear indication of intent. The argument is made that the U.S. Constitution must be rewritten in order to address all of the so-called human rights the United States is ignoring. However, when you look below the surface, what is really happening is that these socialists do not want human rights. Neither do they want real equality. What they want is the creation of a socialist state that controls the lives of those living within it from cradle to grave. They do not want equality of opportunity. They require equality of outcome which is the reality in a beehive or an anthill, not a human settlement. Every so-called concern could be satisfied if the simple expedient of enforcing the current law of the land were followed through, regardless of who was inconvenienced. The problem is, many of those currently tugging on the reins of power would be the ones inconvenienced, and a great many of those use the so-called progressives as their own soldiers of the revolution. It is far easier to command people to do what is wrong if they are so steeped in the lies that make up their belief that they know in their hearts that they're doing the right thing. There is a biblical term for the state of delusion. It is called self-deception. And that is where we are as a country right now.